it was 2010 and I had a really, really bad concussion. So I had some concussions leading up to that, but um, in 2010, it was just a really bad one. Um, and I had to drop out of school. I had to like stop working. I just had to just stop everything and try to get better. Um, but unfortunately when I went to the doctors, they weren't able to help me. So I kept, I had to keep searching for solutions myself. Um, and just looked and looked and looked, went to different practitioners, started doing research myself. Um, but yeah, it, it took me quite a long time to completely recover. And, uh, so then, yeah, so that's how I got into it. I just started researching and writing and I thought, uh, that was the best way to go about it. It's kind of hard to publish what I'm writing about, um, in publications, I guess. So it's, I just kind of just set up my own website and started, started researching and writing and, um, yeah, it all, it all stems back to that really bad concussion in 2010. Yeah. How, if you don't mind me asking, how did you get the concussion? Yeah, so I fell down the stairs in my home. It was my birthday, and all my roommates gave me way too much alcohol. And so it's actually quite embarrassing, an embarrassing way to fall down the stairs. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's how it happened. And, and two, uh, two neurotoxic elements working against you that night, the alcohol mixed with a concussion. Yeah, it wasn't good. So then I hit my head on the on the on the railing, and then also on the way down as well. So I had like double impact. Jeez. Um, but then leading up to that, I played like rep hockey as well. So there's body checking. I think I've had a bunch of different other like minor concussions over the years. So um, yeah, and then also I had like really bad depression and anxiety leading up to that. So it was kind of like a whole like life changing type of uh, experience where I had to sort everything out, right? And uh, so yeah, that's that's how I I got into it. Yeah. So I had really bad brain fog. I had uh, dizziness, so like chronic dizziness. So that was really annoying because <laughs> it just never went away. Um, fatigue, headaches. Um, oh, and then also when this happened, when I had uh, my really bad concussion at home, there was a bunch of black mold in the basement as well. So um, so I it's it's hard to say. It was just kind of all these things together, kind of turned my life upside down. So, um, yeah, so then I had depression and anxiety. I already kind of had that leading up to it, but it got really, really bad after that. Um, I just was just depleted. I lost a lot of weight. I just, it wasn't, wasn't pretty. So, um, yeah, I'm glad I've, uh, got, got far away from that moment, but yeah, yeah. that's, pretty much what happened. Well, I think that's a nice segue into what I want to talk about, what I want to spend most of this podcast talking about, which is brain fog. Uh, so you've, as a result of your personal story and, and trying to recover from your own symptoms, you did a ton of research uh, around brain health and brain fog specifically. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of take me into your paradigm from, from 30,000 feet. What does this look like as far as the, the big picture framework of what are the the, the triggers of why most people would have brain fog related symptoms? And uh, assuming that they didn't uh, get drunk and fall down a staircase. One of the first things I like to look at is food. So I want to make sure that um, their diet isn't ridiculous and they don't have a bunch of like eating gluten or dairy or corn, soy, all the, the common food allergens. Um, usually for people who have really bad brain fog, cleaning up your diet isn't going to reverse it. I, I, well, in my case, it definitely didn't. Um, and I, I have a feeling in a lot of cases it goes beyond food. So I don't, I don't think diet and nutrition is going to be, I guess, the, the main thing that changes everything. But I think in some situations, if people clean up their diet, they'll see a significant improvement in mental clarity and, and overall brain function. So especially if people have undiagnosed celiac disease or, or gluten intolerance. Um, so I had like really bad asthma and acne from, from gluten as well and from dairy. Um, and clearing that up uh, by cutting up gluten and dairy, uh, my skin cleared up, my asthma cleared up. And then my, my brain fog improved as well, but um, it just, it wasn't enough. But I would say most people should start, start there with, with food. I usually recommend like a paleo based diet. So I don't, I'm not, uh, yeah, it doesn't need to be exactly paleo. I think it's, it's, it's like a good template, right? So I'm yeah. um, going, going from there is a good place to start for most people. And I think if they follow something like that, they should see improvements in, in brain fog. So that's usually, that's like the first step, but, um, there's usually a number of other problems that can happen as well, like hormones. I think that's maybe number two. I really think people need to check hormones and in particular, making sure they don't have any sort of 
subclinical hypothyroidism, so or or full blown hypothyroidism, because uh, a lot of doctors they miss that. Um, they don't necessarily check free T3, for example. Um, and so in my case, my my free T3 was very low, but my TS, TSH and T4 looked fine. So they didn't. No one said anything, right? So and uh, so I think looking at hormones like yeah, thyroid hormone, um, testosterone as well for men especially. So um, again, in my, my case, I had, I had normal total testosterone, but my free testosterone fell. Uh, it was like at the level of like a nine-year-old man. So that was probably one reason why I felt like I was old and aging. So um, yeah, and so I think there are a lot of people walking around with with undiagnosed thyroid conditions and and low testosterone, and they just they just don't know it. And so I think, yeah, investigating hormones overall is very important. And even um, checking for like IGF-1, for example, that was one thing I didn't really even think of for a long time. Um, but yeah, checking insulin-like growth factor one, because, well, in my case, I had that brain injuries, right? So um, a lot of people with brain injuries, their hormones can, can be completely thrown off and, and just they're a mess. So, um, but I think even in the general population, I think, there's a lot of people with, with low uh, hormones. So that's, uh, that's a, those are like the two main things that I would, I would look at. But um, there's other, like other reasons, like other non-physical reasons. So like things like trauma and nervous system dysregulation. Let's get, get into some of these other causes uh, in a moment, but I want to maybe zoom out um, a, just a little bit. So like before we talk about some of the, the other specific causes, What's actually going on at the brain level in terms of physiological mechanisms, um, biochemical mechanisms, and so on, that, that, that are actually creating the symptoms of brain fog? Uh, and I, you know, there's, there's sort of a variety of different theories that I've seen from people talking about brain fog. Some people talk more about neuroinflammation. Others talk more about excitotoxicity. Some people talk about leaky blood-brain barrier or mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, what's, what's your take on sort of the, the mechanisms at the brain level? I think it's a combination of most of those things or all of those things. I, I think, I think it's multiple things at once. I don't think you can pinpoint one thing. I do think inflammation is a huge part of it. You had mentioned leaky gut, um, and then leaky brain as well. So the, the gut brain axis is very critical, uh, when it comes to, uh, brain fog. So I think, I think it's all these different things. I think mitochondria dysfunction, yeah, that's a big part of it as well. Um, but, but, um, yeah. And, and the thing is, is a lot of like these underlying factors like mitochondria dysfunction and uh, leaky gut, they cross over from just general brain fog to, uh, people with depression, people with chronic fatigue syndrome, people with fibromyalgia. There's these underlying factors that, that are common between all of them. Right. And brain fog is sort of part of depression and people with chronic fatigue syndrome tend to have brain fog as well. So. I think it's it's all these things at one uh, happening at once, and I don't I I can't really say exactly what one thing it would be. I think it's probably a combination of all of them. Um, yeah. All together. Yeah. I'm I'm with you on that. I I actually I have to say that myopic singling out of one particular mechanism in isolation and saying this is the only thing that's going on, uh, I think is almost always misguided. And there's far too many people that are doing it. Um, yeah. and, and these things are all vicious cycles and you can conceptualize one as sort of the crux or the most important one. But, uh, there's a lot of people that are just saying, Hey, it's all about this one thing. Um, yeah. and so, you know, it's all about psychological stress. So all you need is to meditate and recite these affirmations and so on. Yeah. And I, and I think like people get really close specifically on one thing that they're, they specialize in, which makes sense. When you really zero in and study and you're like an expert on that one thing, mm -hmm. um, you kind of forget about the big picture and so in my case i've been looking at all these different things and so it's hard to really really say exactly um if i had to say one i would think mitochondria dysfunction mm -hmm. would be the main one and all the other ones kind of linked to that but yeah um but uh yeah it's still they're all they're all intertwined i guess totally so uh you mentioned nutrition you mentioned mm -hmm. hormones i want mm -hmm. to come back to hormones later and maybe talk some details there, but um, what, what are some of the other big causes or triggers of uh, brain fog for most people? I think um, another big one would be just general toxicity, like neurotoxicity. 
toxicity. And, and I guess linked to that would be also the drugs people are taking as well. So, um, so I was eventually put on a bunch of psychiatric drugs after my concussion to deal uh, with the symptoms of depression, anxiety. So, um, so I know firsthand how these drugs can, can cause some, I think, damage to the brain. And I think they're, especially when they start piling on different drugs, it can be a toxic mix of, of drugs, right? So, and I think there's a lot of different people who are, yeah, we put on put on these drugs and they're and they're experiencing negative symptoms, including brain fog from these drugs. And it's not just psychiatric drugs; it can be um, even antibiotics and antihistamines and um, antipsychotics, which actually that falls under psychiatric drugs. But anyways, it's these all these drugs. I think overall can cause damage. And uh, now not everyone is on drugs, but a increasing amount of people are taking drugs. So I think. Um, if someone's experiencing brain fog, they do need to look closely at the drugs they're taking. And the thing is, is with me, is it, it kind of built up over time. And I, at first I thought I was okay taking these drugs, but then uh, it, it was like increasingly becoming toxic uh, over time. And so I didn't really connect the dots at first. So yeah, that's another part of my story is I, I feel like I had like a chemical brain injury as well with the, with the drugs and the mold. Mm. Anyways, it's kind of all a mess, but I think that's all also a big a big part of it and even after people come off these drugs often they um they can ex still experience brain fog and mitochondria dysfunction uh, like a lot of people would take uh i forget the specific class of antibiotics but um they they get negatively affected by the, the antibiotics and even after they're done taking them they have pretty severe mitochondria dysfunction and brain fog so yeah um i think that's another another big part of it and then not just drugs but there's so many different chemicals and, and heavy metals in the environment that I think most people have them in their body or, or everyone does. Um, and so um, that's another part of it as well is the accumulation of different heavy metals like lead and mercury. So um, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, another really big piece of it. And then, um, and I guess wrapped up in toxicity would be also environmental EMFs as well that I think are a problem. And I think people who develop like EMF sensitivity, it, in my opinion, it's not necessarily the EMFs that are such a huge problem. Um, although I do think they are, it's just when people start picking up on the EMFs in their environment, I guess it, it becomes an issue of their body is already so toxic that now they're, they're experiencing EMF sensitivity as well. And so I have some history with that as well. So, um, anyway, so that, I think that's another big, big part of it is, um, toxicity from different chemicals and drugs and, uh, environmental toxins. Yeah. What about the role? I'll, I'll mention a few things: um, chronic stress, mm -hmm. uh, nervous system dysregulation, past trauma, uh, poor circulation, blood sugar dysregulation, uh, lack of physical activity. Do you want to? Do you do you consider any of those uh, to be major players in this? Yeah, I think chronic stress and anxiety would be a big part of it as well, and even um, yeah, just trauma from even from years ago as well, from like childhood trauma could be a big part of it as well. Um, because I, I think in some instances, people have brain fog almost as if like, like a defense mechanism um, from, from whatever stressful situation they, they have, they're going through or they, they have gone through. And sometimes the, the fog doesn't go away. So um, I guess I would fall under like depersonalization and, and derealization. Um, but yeah, I think that's a big part of it as well because um, like I had, some trauma from my childhood and growing up as well before the head injury. And uh, so a big part of my recovery was doing things like neural feedback and uh, EMDR. So eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. So those are just, well, EMDR, especially is a trauma-based therapy and then neural feedback. Well, that's also trauma-based therapy, but it's more focused on uh, calming the nervous system. It's kind of like advanced meditation, right? So um, yeah. So all that to say, I think, uh, focusing on trauma and stress and calming the nervous system, whether that's just meditation or finding a neurofeedback practitioner is very important. And I think it's, uh, it's not always appreciated because I think a lot of people are walking around with, with trauma and stress built up, um, some worse than others. But um, yeah, and if, if you have brain fog, I, I think for a lot of people, it is a key part of it as well. Not always though. I, I just, I do think, for some people, it, they need to they need to look there instead of always chasing the next supplement or the, the next physical ailment that may be causing it. Right. So, um, yeah, 
that's what I think about fatty acids. Gotcha. What do you think of blood sugar dysregulation, you know, maybe just from poor diet or poor metabolic health and, and, and also poor circulation and the idea that uh, there isn't enough oxygen being delivered to the brain? Yeah, I have seen studies, especially with um, people with chronic fatigue syndrome that they found, I guess it was lack of blood flow uh, to the brain. So I think for people with chronic fatigue syndrome, I think that's a key part of it. Um, and then also with blood sugar, uh, like low blood sugar can definitely contribute to, uh, to brain fog. And I think, yeah, trying to get rid of all refined carbohydrates from the diet can be pretty important, especially if you're struggling with brain fog. Um, and just sticking with things like sweet potatoes and, um, and just lots of fruits and vegetables can make a big difference. And then obviously eating enough uh, protein and fat. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, that, that's also, those are also very important parts. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the role of neurotransmitters in all of this? And this is, this is something that I will say I've encountered quite a lot of mixed information on, and I, I'm generally somewhat skeptical of neurotransmitter-based discussions and explanations of things at this point, because from what I, I think there's been a lot of reductionism around this and you know, starting with the whole conceptualization of, of depression as a serotonin deficiency and the need for SSRIs. And, you know, there's been a, a huge narrative around understanding mental health problems as neurotransmitter imbalances. Uh, and I think that is extremely reductionistic and is missing a lot of, you know, key parts of the picture, many of which you've already mentioned. Um, but also, you see people kind of explaining symptoms based on, oh, do you, are you dominant in this neurotransmitter or that one? From what I can tell, the actual testing for neurotransmitters is, uh, is really complex and not that scientifically valid in a lot of cases. Like you can do urinary measurements of certain neurotransmitters, but it doesn't necessarily, like it's not valid data in many cases where you know, they, they've done research to show that, hey, if your urine shows this neurotransmitter is low, then we know that that means that you have low neurotransmitter, that, you know, that neurotransmitter is low in the brain. Um, a lot of that scientifically validating research isn't really there. But what, what is your general take on neurotransmitters? Do you conceptualize them as having a small or a really big role in all of this? I don't think, I, I agree with almost everything you said. I think the testing is not reliable. I do have a lot of people come to me and they say, oh, I think I have low serotonin or, or low dopamine. And I, I do think it's interesting to research, research it and learn about it and learn about how you can increase dopamine and increase serotonin and re increase oxytocin, for example. And I've even wrote articles about that, but I, I don't think I, I still picture it as uh, managing symptoms. If you're if you're taking something to boost dopamine, or you're taking something to calm yourself down, like with different supplements and herbs, I still think it's yeah, it's it's taking the approach of the pharmaceutical industry essentially, and 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 which is not. I don't agree with that approach overall, and I don't think it's based on good science, right? And so it's more marketing by the pharmaceutical industry than it is real science so but i do think it can be valuable um because i'm just i'm just interested in everything about the brain so it's like like i still i'm interested to know what can boost dopamine and how people can use those things to support themselves day to day um but i don't think it's yeah i don't think it's the root cause and i don't think people um should focus on it as much as they do and when a lot of people come to me and yeah, they, they want to, they're taking amino acids for dopamine or amino acids for the mood. I'm, that's fine. That's, that's great. But I think there's probably other directions people need to go to get better. And so like before, uh, yeah, I used to take, for example, DL phenylalanine, which supports dopamine, supports my mood. Um, but I don't anymore because I, I went in another direction and started doing some other things that seem to be more permanent. I didn't, I don't need to take it as much. Now. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's how I see it anyways. And, um, yeah, I, I agree that the testing isn't, isn't sound. I want to come back to what you, what you just said about, you know, going in another direction and talk specifics there. But, um, first I, I want to ask you, what is your sort of general approach to assessing what triggers may be going on in a person who has brain fog and how do you sort of help them figure out 
you know, which of these different triggers that, that you've just mentioned might be the major factor for them? Well, I usually ask them to, I guess, give me an entire history of what's happened to them. And I try to ask for like the most in-depth type of information that they can give me as much as they feel comfortable doing it. Um, and then based on that, um, I also ask for like any blood tests or any, uh, yeah, any blood tests or the supplements they're taking or the medications and their history overall. And from there, I, I can kind of see patterns. Uh, it's, it's, I guess it's not the most uh, regimented scientific type of approach, but I, I, and then also talking to the person, I can kind of see where they're coming from and what they've gone through. Um, and so I, for example, I'll see some people contact me and they, I do a consult with them and they're taking so many supplements, but they have like the worst anxiety ever. And they've tried every supplement. They, they're like, oh, what supplement should I take? Should I do this? Should I do that? And then I find out that they may have had a really rough childhood or they, they were bullied or they've been diagnosed with PTSD and they're trying to find nutrients to help them. And I, so I try to point them in a different direction. I say, go check out neurofeedback or EMDR, for example. Um, and then, yeah, so that it's, it's hard to say exactly how I approach it, but yeah, that's... recognition. I mean, it's, uh, what you're talking about is basically your own clinical experience and knowledge, the amalgam of all of that and experience of working with people that your brain is looking for patterns in all of the data that you're assessing. And then, you know, mm -hmm. for every individual that you're seeing, you're, you're going to pick up on a particular pattern and say, Oh, I think, you know, it's, it's more of these causes and less of these causes. Yeah. And I also try to help people try to find practitioners in their area that can, that I think can really help them too. So I don't really, I don't, I'm not the one trying to fix them. I guess you could say I'm, I'm just trying to be a guide because I've gone through so much that it's like, I, I feel like I've gone through it all. So well, probably not all, but a lot. So I know what people are going through and I know where they should focus. So I'm, yeah, I'm kind of more of a guide than a, a complete problem solver. For, and for a lot of these people that I'm dealing with, they're like me and they, they're really they got really sick, right? And and they're and it's uh, going to take some time, and and uh, so yeah, it's it's not it's it can be tricky, right? So I, I try to just point people in the right directions and get them on the right track. So I, I want to um, I want to come back to a couple of things that you mentioned in passing before. One is nervous system dysregulation. So mm -hmm. do you want to talk a bit more about what you mean by that and and kind mm -hmm. of what's going on on a on a mechanism level? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess when I, I think of nervous system dysregulation, maybe that's not the right, the best way to put it, but I think of trauma and the, the body's response to trauma and, and holding on to stress. So um, I, I think of, yeah, I, I, I picture the things that really help me. So the, the EMDR, like I mentioned, neurofeedback, and even something called somatic experiencing, which is a type of trauma therapy. It's a really good book, uh, The Body Keeps Score. Mm -hmm. by um i forget the doctor's name right now but um anyway so th that's how i that's that's what i picture when i when i'm talking about nervous system dysregulation um so and and when i went to my neurofeedback practitioner she did this cute eeg brain mapping so she looked at all my brain waves and she found like electrical abnormalities in, in my brain waves so um yeah i guess that's that's what i'm picturing i'm thinking people who have trauma and it's actually like stored in their in their energy and in their body and it's not a, a pure physical uh problem per se mm -hmm. um, so yeah that's how i see it so what what kinds of specific dysfunction do you think are uh i, I guess the most common sorts of dysfunction that you see in people with let's say chronic fatigue so i think uh, for me as a clinician when i see a patient that comes in it's and it's really common to see so many patients when you ask them to list their chief complaints in order of what's bothering or impacting their life the most i mean fatigue chronic fatigue is really a, a very common uh chief complaint but whenever i see chronic fatigue my first question to them is um do you have fatigue just throughout the day or do you have fatigue when you use your brain so i'll give an example um, brain-based fatigue happens when you use your brain so they'll say, you know, I'm really tired after I drive. If I'm on the computer for an hour, I fatigue. That's a brain-based fatigue 
um, mechanism. So, and depending on what part of the brain is not functioning well. So if someone has like a frontal cortex that's unhealthy, if they are focused on attention and concentration for a period of time, and it's very easy for them to have low endurance in those pathways and fatigue. If someone has like a cerebellar issue of the brain that's degenerating or not healthy, like standing all day or just standing for a 20 or 30 minutes can really exhaust them for the whole day. And so it can have a global effect on the brain. But when you look at fatigue and you kind of break it down simply just as a way to understand it from a brain model versus a metabolic model, metabolic fatigue happens all the time. It happens for no reason. It's just there. <laughs> Brain-based fatigue has, ha happens when you use your brain. So a lot of times when patients really think about it, sometimes their fatigue really isn't adrenal, it's not anemia, and it's not metabolic, and it's not thyroid, it's not a hidden infection, it's not a chemical toxicity, it's just their brain is not healthy. <laughs> and uh, that's one of the key symptoms. So the first sign of neurodegeneration in the way the brain works is as it starts to degenerate and fail, um, one of the earliest symptoms is low endurance of the brain, and then that presents fatigue. So when your brain shuts down, um, everything shuts down. <laughs> So you, you know, when your brain shuts down, you don't want to move, you don't want to do anything, you don't want to stimulate, have any stimulation for the brain, you just want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. So that's really the pattern of brain-based fatigue. Now, what I also notice as a clinician is when people come in with fatigue, how they get treated really depends on where they go. So just like we talked about different theories of the brain, I mean, uh, that's not uncommon with practitioners. The practitioners, you know, there's a Lyme doc, there's the adrenal doc. There's the chemical toxicity doctor. There's the, and that's kind of kind of the lens they see it through. And I think one of the biggest mistakes clinicians can ever make is when they just accept one model. And they, and you know what's interesting is, is is working with practitioners and teaching and being on the road for over 20 years, um, and and getting to see all different variations of how people practice. What I've noticed is most practitioners kind of pick what they do because of their own experience with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, like, if I see a live doc, I pretty much know in their history they probably had live. <laughs> Yeah. Be a doctor who's like asked to treat their adrenals, they probably had a good experience treating their adrenals and they felt better. And then they kind of see the world that way. So right. you've probably seen the same thing. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes. I, I also think that there's this really unique kind of fascinating and unfortunate psychological tendency that humans have where we tend to always try to reduce things down to the one thing. Yeah. And I, I think just we're psychologically wired to say, you know, once, once we start, let's say, getting some results with an adrenal supplement. We're like, oh, it's adrenal fatigue and it's all about the adrenals. And, and, you know, and then our brain just goes that way and we, we kind of dig our trench and say, this is my position and this is what I think it's all about. Exactly. So I, I really appreciate what you're saying here that we need to have a much more, a much broader and more encompassing perspective that looks at all of the different pieces of the puzzle and how they fit together. <laughs> So let me, uh, let me give you some, some, some further insight into that as a clinician. Um, so, you know, when you look, when you work with patients that are chronic and they're suffering from fatigue and they've got a whole list of issues, first of all, if they're suffering from fatigue, that means at the end of the day, they lost their physiological ability to make ATP, right? So that's the final common pathway is they can't make ATP, whether it's a mitochondrial defect, whether it's not getting enough fuel, whether it's oxidative stress, whether it's a hormonal issue, whether it's a chemical issue, that they're all, they're all up for grabs. They're, up for, <laughs> they're all ready to play. Now, at, when you have long-term mechanisms that cause fatigue, you do have insult or lack of function of the mitochondria, right? But the biggest effect of that we really see on the brain, and the brain is one of the early signs of where this happens, because the brain is, has what's called post-mitotic tissue. Once you, once you develop cells there, you don't develop new, new cells. There's some new research being done with neurogenesis and things like that, but they they're, have very limited expressions, and we don't really, you know, uh, make more neurons in, <laughs> than what we really get when we're born. So when people have uh, various mechanisms causing it, there sometimes it tends to be an effect on the brain and everything else gets treated besides the brain. So brain health is really a key factor, I think, for a lot of people that have fatigue uh, and not really focusing on how to recover their brain, their brain function is a, a overlooked area with chronic fatigue issues. Mm -hmm. So I think if uh, you're a person searching for your cause of fatigue or if you're a clinician working with practitioners, one of the easiest questions to ask is, if you have fatigue, is it all the time? Is it, which is more of like a metabolic type of thing? Does it come and go? Or does it have to have after meals? Does it have to have some event? But if it's very specific to, if I read a chapter, I'm done. If I <laughs> try to do this activity, I'm finished. Okay. Those are pretty straightforward brain-related fatigue mechanisms. Okay, so let's, let's dig into brain-related fatigue. Specifically. Sure. And I, I assume that's very much intertwined with brain fog. Those two things kind of go together, do they not? Or, or how do they, wh where do they differentiate? 
So brain fog is, uh, yeah, they do, they do, they go together. Brain fog is typically it takes place when neurons are not synapsing properly. So, uh, you know, neurons communicate with each other uh, through a synapse a message. Certain things can slow that communication down. So one of the major things is inflammation. Inflammation can impact uh, how efficiently neurons synapse together. And as the synaptic rate slows down, people can't find words, people can't focus, people can't do the tasks they normally do, or it takes them longer to get there. And uh, many people explain that as brain fatigue. So whenever we hear brain fatigue, we, we tend to think that there could be an inflammatory component to it. Um, but they don't always overlap. Um, so sometimes people just uh, don't even have that connection with brain fog. They just lose their function and, and get really, really tired and don't really have that as part of the component. Now, one of the earliest signs of brain fatigue is actually neurodegeneration. So, you know, you don't just develop Parkinson's, you don't just develop dementia. So let's talk about dementia, which is really prevalent. It's really common, something that we're all at risk for as we get older. I, I just want to quickly interrupt. So you said one of the biggest signs of brain fatigue is neurodegeneration. Is it, or did well, you let me, let me, let me one of the biggest signs yeah. of neurodegeneration is brain fatigue? Yeah, let me clarify that. I'm sorry. Uh, so one of the first things we see with early neurodegeneration is brain fatigue. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think what people understand is when they start to have their brain health compromised, they start to lose their brain endurance. And as they lose their brain endurance, they get tired. And when they get tired, they start to look for other things that, causing, that are causing it. For example, let's just stick with the adrenal glands. Oh, my adrenal glands are so wiped out. I got to take adrenal support and I got to take adaptogens. And maybe they do and maybe they don't. And maybe they do and it gives them a little boost and maybe they do it and it has no effect there still could be an underlying neurodegenerative process. <laughs> and supporting the adrenals may not be what they need to do. They may need to get, get in there and aggressively support the brain health and make a difference that way. So uh, it's one of the most commonly overlooked things when we see patients that have fatigue. They don't think that the brain's part of it. And then quite honestly, when you look at uh, the field of healthcare professionals practicing, whether it's MDs or DOs or DCs or NDs or family nurse practitioners or nutritionists or dietitians, they're not really trained in how to find early brain degeneration. They don't even consider it as a possibility. They wait for a person to have tremors or they wait for a person to completely lose their way home or not remember family member names before they even go down that clinical route. But many, many, many people start to have early signs of neurodegeneration, especially in their 30s and 40s. And each decade, the risk goes up. And that then causes their... Um, endurance and their neurological pathways to be compromised. And then they try to use their brain doing their everyday tasks that exhaust them. Then they search from one practitioner to the next, trying to find something for their fatigue. And uh, they waste a lot of time. And at the end of the day, they, they don't realize that they really have a neurodegenerative process that's being overlooked. So uh, one of the other factors that you mentioned as a big factor in brain health is circulation and mm -hmm. oxygen delivery to the brain. Mm -hmm. So what, what are some of the underlying causes that might impair that aspect of things? Um, well, we know, well, some people do have subtle anemia, so we just want to look at a CBC. And then just one of the key factors is poor circulation. So, you know, a lot of times uh, people complain of cold hands, cold feet. So you can just palpate it. You can see it. And, you know, one of the key things for people that have poor circulation is, They'll notice the best brain function if they exercise and move and their blood flow and circulation come back and the energy is there. So a typical thing you see with the patients got like uh, chronic fatigue issues related to lack of blood flow to the brain is when they actually move and they notice that their circulation changes for the next few hours, they have the best amount of energy. And then as they, the hands and feet get cold again, their energy goes down. So sometimes we'll have patients kind of track their fatigue levels and their brain function symptoms based on how they feel temperature on their hand and feet. And uh, they can actually get a surface thermometer and just kind of measure their hand and feet. And they can kind of compare the temperature in their wrist compared to the temperature in their fingertips. They see like a 10, 10 degree difference. That's usually a sign of poor circulation. And then if you can start to correlate their energy level, like they notice their brain function is great and their energy levels are great. And then they measure their temperature and it's somewhat normal. <laughs> And then they notice when their function's down. That really helps us as, a as in a clinical window determine like, well, we have to improve your circulation. Mm -hmm. So then we'll maybe consider strategies um, to improve the circulation, which may be things like uh, things like venpocetine, which activates endothelial nitric oxide synthase. That's a really fantastic way to get uh, improved circulation, butcher's broom, different types of compounds. Uh, just in the fact that they can just do some physical exercise and uh, 
decrease things that impact their adrenaline levels, that could be an issue there. So those are all things that they should do. I, I'm sure that there are a number of different like overt genetic conditions that might impair uh, you know, circulation, like mitral valve prolapse or, or something like that. Um, how much of this, the, the circulatory issues, do you think are, are, are more a direct function of nutrition and lifestyle inadequacies? Like somebody's just m like mostly sedentary and maybe their heart muscle itself is just not that strong. Well, yeah, so that's a good point. So some, I mean, I would say very few, a few cases are related to things like heart disease or things like mitral valve prolapse or some kind of pulmonary issue or lung disease. Those are more significant and uh, those are usually associated with secondary disease. Now, the other things are there's some genetic susceptibilities for some people. I mean, um, one of the things we know with the whole, with all the studies being done, the Genome, Human Genome Project and just the genotype is that there's so much variation between them. We don't know what all the gene SNPs mean. Um, and we don't know what the gene SNPs mean in combination. And I think at this point, the scientific community is at the point where they have to use machine learning to try to interpret all this because it's just there's too many variables to do it. Um, so in a clinical setting, though, behind the science where the genes really fit in, we know that there's a genotype. And then all you, all you can really do in a clinical setting is try to modulate the phenotype, their genes plus environment, nutrition, and lifestyle. So when you see someone come in and they tell you, well, everyone, their everyone, their sisters, their mom, their grandmother, they all have really cold hands and feet and they're always get cold. There's probably some type of unique genetic uniqueness that uh, impacts various receptor pathways. But at the end of the day, uh, those things can be one of the reasons why they're not functioning as well as they can. If they can change those things, it can be a factor. Sedentary lifestyle is for sure one of the most common ones for poor circulation. <laughs> um, and some people are prone to things like hypothyroidism and uh, uh, various things. But I think as a clinician and as a patient suffering through it, you just kind of have to go through and figure all those things out and find the best way you can uh, change the expression of your genes to, to make a difference, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a couple specific questions on that. One, are you aware of any other sort of common lifestyle factor other than, than exercise that, can, that has a strong effect on circulatory uh, function? A sedentary lifestyle and physically active is the single most common factor. Okay. okay? That is without question. Um, the other part of it could be, well, like we just talked about some of the genetic variations we don't totally understand and why some people have issues there. Like we see people who work out all the time, but everyone in their family has cold hands and cold feet and the circulation is poor. And we, if we can do things to change the expression of that, then they do better. But, um, but they always have that vulnerability outside of uh, basic sedentary lifestyle and movement and genes. I'm not really sure of anything that comes to mind that is a key factor there. Okay. Gotcha. You know, I, I always wondered, you know, just the fact that we're living such indoor lives now and we have yeah. so much less exposure to just infrared rays from sunlight, from just spending time outdoors. Mm -hmm. I, I was, I always just kind of thought that that might have a big impact on things because, mm -hmm. you know, I might in the middle of my house, I might feel cold in the winter and, you know, it might be as simple as going outdoors and just getting some rays of sun on my skin. And all of a sudden I no longer have cold hands and feet. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And every person is unique to themselves. And, yeah. you know, you yeah. have to kind of dig through all that and figure out the best strategy. So over 20 years ago, I was in a really bad car accident mm -hmm. and I had broken three ribs. I dislocated my shoulder. And as a consequence of that, I had I ended up with chronic pain. Right. And so the pain was just debilitating. I was unable to do the things that I really enjoyed doing like being active and exercising. I just couldn't do that anymore. And it was just really, I felt so hopeless. I didn't think there was anything I can do because everything I tried within conventional medicine, you know, that's all I knew didn't work. So I actually went back to school to <laughs> figure it out. And I, like I said, I I went back to school. I got a, mas a master's in nutrition. I did a postdoc in clinical neurology. I studied functional medicine, chiropractic, acupuncture, anything I could get my hands on to figure out that chronic pain. And I'm so glad I did because a lot of the things that I learned in school, I was able to resolve that chronic pain. And more importantly, I hadn't realized it at the time, but during that car accident I was in, I had also sustained a concussion. Now it's because the the pain from the neck and shoulder and the ribs, that was like the most important pressing thing for me to, to figure out. So I didn't even realize when I began to develop these strange neurological symptoms, like um, I used to have, I, you know, before 
I remember this one time I was sitting in a restaurant and all of a sudden the whole room moved like this. It was like, like counterclockwise, the whole room felt like it, like, I don't know, like someone took the actual room and moved it. And I almost fell off my stool. <laughs> I was eating tacos that happened. I almost fell off my stool and I de started developing these, what I learned later on was called oscillopsia. It's, it's a type of vertigo. It's a really weird type of vertigo, but that was, I didn't really know what happened. It came out of nowhere, but then all these other symptoms I started to develop, like in addition to the vertigo, I'd start to develop anxiety and worry. And I never really had those issues growing up and even more darker psychological symptoms, just like negative thoughts that I just took over my life. And that was, it was really weird for me because I, like I said, I, I grew up in a really good family. I didn't have any of these major health issues, right? Growing up and it was just so strange to me. And then I, what I did, I just kind of sat down and looked back at my own history, like I do for my patients. I'm like, oh my goodness, a lot of these weird neurological mental symptoms started after that initial car accident. So from there, then I just got to work with, you know, everything that I had at my disposal, my training, and I, the things that I had actually recommended to my patients, I began to experiment with myself again. And I went deep into the world of concussion, exploring all the latest research there was and applied it to my own brain. And I was able to heal from that really scary dark time as well so quite a story yeah but yeah that's that's the reason why i became a functional neurologist for my through my own personal experiences dealing with these health issues both the chronic pain as well as concussion and unfortunately not finding answers within conventional medicine so i decided to go outside the box mm -hmm. and again i'm so glad that i did because now right i can share that with you know, the countless patients and uh, people throughout the world who need this information. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you did too. I've heard a number of uh, stories from, from people in my audience that have worked with you that have really benefited hugely from, from your work. So um, I'm sure they're pretty happy that, that, you know, you, you found your way into this field. So, so glad to hear that. Yeah, that makes, that's my, that makes my heart sing because that's why I do it. Yeah. So you've mentioned uh, this term brain fatigue a few times. Can you explain what that is and, and how it might differ from, let's say, fatigue more broadly, like low physical energy levels? And what sort of what are the signs or symptoms of that that someone could identify? I have brain fatigue that might indicate a brain specific issue. Yeah, great question. So to, again, to create a distinction, like fatigue overall is just the sense of tiredness and this physical, sometimes like heaviness, right, that people can experience. I'm sure your audience knows all too well. Um, but when we talk about brain fatigue, it's more triggered by mental activities or brain activities. Um, actually, yeah, to, to be even more specific, when I talk about uh, mental activities or brain functions, mental activities just falls into one category of brain functions. There's so many others that we'll talk about in a second that's important to this conversation and this question. But yeah, brain fatigue is like when your brain just feels tired, right? Where you're not able to think clearly. Um, it's not quite the same as brain fog, but I see that very, very common. They come hand in hand, right? So if somebody's reading or they're using their mind, their mental capacities, they just start to get really tired. So I have a lot of patients who, after their concussion, they're able, to, they were like, they killed it at their work or whatever job that they had. They were high achievers. They were able to really, they did really well, right? And they took pride in their brain function. But then after, for example, like a concussion, they can do the same amount of work, but like at 25% their capacity, sometimes 10 or 15%, right? So they'd be able to think, and that area of their brain wasn't injured, but the endurance, that brain endurance. So they might sit down and try to read or, you know, analyze some problems or something. And then within five, 10 minutes, they would just get fatigued and crash, right? So that's an example of brain fatigue. But the interesting thing is, and that's the thing, a lot of people think, that when we talk about brain function, it's all about mental functions and cognitive capacities. 
Well, guess what? Your brain is in charge of virtually every single function that we have. I mean, it allows us to move through the world, like to ambulate and to walk around. It allows us to have good balance, to have good core stability. It allows us to move our eyes around properly so we can, you know, scan an environment and perceive things visually. It allows us to perceive uh, like sounds and when I'm speaking right now to be able to hear clearly and process what that means, right? So the brain doesn't just isn't just involved in mental cognitive functions. It's involved with movement functions, our emotional state. It's also involved in stress response, right? There's a whole there's whole regions of the nervous system that control the stress response. This area we call the brain stem, and in particular, the top part of the brain stem known as the mesencephalon. That plays a huge role in setting, setting the tone for our stress response. In addition to that, our brains also control digestive function. So my point is, when we say something like brain function or brain fatigue, one way it can look, and most people then can relate with it, is, yeah, you know, I'm reading or I'm trying to use some cognitive capabilities and I get really tired. So that's, you know, a very classical sign of brain fatigue. Mm -hmm. But it can also be like... Um, you know, after a certain trauma or concussion or after like chronic periods of stress, whenever I'm in a car now, I get nauseous or I get motion sick. That's a form of brain fatigue as well. It's just a different area of the brain we call the vestibular system mm -hmm. getting fatigued. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that kind of, so, yeah. That, that kind of actually the last part of what you said segues into the next thing I wanted to ask, which is you've mentioned concussions a lot in relationship to the symptom of brain fatigue. And I know this is a big area of specialty for you. Um, but are there other potential causes of brain fatigue other than a concussion or some kind of physical trauma? Yeah, absolutely. And really at the end of the day, this is, this is what I look at. This is what I research. This is a big part of what helped me heal. And allowed me to help countless patients and clients throughout the years is really exploring what is the root cause of all of this? Like what's the root cause of brain fatigue? And concussion is a common trigger for it. But the reason for that is because concussion is a common trigger for brain inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. What we call neuroinflammation. So as an example, and there's so many different pathways to neuroinflammation is, as you know, right? Concussion is just one of them, right? There's a physical trauma that you can have to your brain that can then trigger an inflammatory response in a person's nervous system. But as you know, so can like a gut infection that can also trigger brain inflammation leading to brain fatigue or just overall fatigue. So there's these different triggers and stressors on the nervous system that when it leads to inflammation, that's one of the biggest root causes I see for brain fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so, but in particular, when we talk about concussion, right, what I found is one of the major reasons, and, and by the way, as you know, right, and most of your audience probably knows, inflammation, even inflammation in the nervous system, it's a natural part of the healing response. We need inflammation to protect us from, you know, the critters and, you know, viruses and bacteria, even toxins or dietary food proteins that we're exposed to, right? It's part of the healing response. But the problem is when it gets stuck in that on position, right? When that inflammation becomes chronic. And there's a whole cascade that happens within the nervous system related to what we call microglial cells, which are the immune cells of the brain. And when they get stuck in that on position, they, instead of helping to clean up debris and heal the brain, they become inflammatory and they shift into these states that become really damaging to the nervous system. So the question is, and that's what I've seen a lot with concussions in particular, but um, what ends up happening, one of the reasons why people get stuck in these inflammatory states of their nervous system and experience things like brain fatigue is because of what's known as leaky brain, right? A breakdown of the blood brain barrier. And so really briefly, the blood brain barrier is this single cell layer that protects our brain from like external forces that are trying to come in and wreak havoc, like things like bacteria, viruses, toxins, chemicals. But what I found is after concussion and what the research shows, 
leaky brain, there's that you can actually have a tear of the blood brain barrier. And that was actually a big part of my, um, yeah, my hitting rock bottom as well. And so I see that with a lot of my patients after concussion, they have a tear of the blood brain barrier, then that triggers this massive inflammatory response. But guess what? The inflammation continues to damage the blood brain barrier and becomes this vicious cycle. And so for those of you out there who don't know what the blood brain barrier is, it's similar to the gut barrier, right? We have all these different barriers throughout our bodies. We have the gut barrier, we have the lung barrier, we have the skin barrier, and then we have the blood brain barrier. So it's similar to that, right? But just like you can have leaky gut, you can also have leaky brain. So that's what I discovered, right? A lot of my patients after concussion, especially the ones that didn't heal and recover is, you know, typically within a matter of weeks, people heal after a concussion. But just like me, I, it took me years to heal. And a big part of it was because of this leaky brain. And that's what I found almost 99% of the time across the board with my patients after concussion. But again, the interesting thing is when we talk about root causes, concussion isn't the only thing that can trigger a leaky brain, right? So can stress, believe it or not, like the the toxic hormones, like in excessive amounts, can actually damage the blood brain barrier. So, can chemical toxins that can also lead to things to a breach of the blood brain barrier? So, the list goes on and on. But my point is what I found across the board, right? Number one, inflammation, num big common root cause for brain fatigue, right? And especially brain inflammation, aka neuroinflammation. And number two, one of the most common reasons why I see people get stuck in that inflammatory cycle is leaky brain. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So if I was going to summarize um, everything you just said in a succinct way, um, and I was going to sort of see it through the way that I like to look at things, I like to look at things through kind of a three-tier model of sort of first layer is environment and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. then what are the cellular mechanisms of how those problems at the environment and lifestyle level are leading to problems in the body? And yeah, then what awesome. are the problems in the body? So what are the, the sort of physiological problems and the symptoms that are resulting from that or disease state that is resulting mm -hmm. from that? So yeah, this would look something like environmental and lifestyle issues, whether it's psychological stress, physical trauma, like concussion, mm -hmm. or, um, toxin exposures or poor nutrition, I would imagine probably sleep deprivation is lumped in there as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and circadian rhythm disruption and some combination of those kinds of things then is being translated into, um, increased neuroinflammation, mm -hmm. increased, uh, and maybe a leaky blood brain barrier and, um, increased microglial activation. So microglial Overactivation. Yeah, you got and then it. is that? It, would you, would you say that's accurate? Would you add anything to that picture? No, that's awesome. Yeah, exactly. That's there's these external environment uh, like triggers, right? The epigenetic, uh, you know, <laughs> triggers we have that we experience, and then leading to exactly what you're saying: the microglia activation. And if it's severe enough, if the trauma is severe enough, or like the toxic exposure or stress, sleep deprivation then yeah, that barrier in the brain can become breached. And then from there, it becomes this vicious cycle. So yeah, you nailed it. 